lose everything. We're gonna lose it all. We may have lost our mass, but I'm not gonna let the dream die yet. This is the incredible story of survival of sailing vessel Niniwahuni, whose mast came crashing down onto the boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The mother and three kids were rescued by a cargo ship, but the husband refused to abandon their home and had to try survive on his own a grueling 950 nautical miles upwind back to Mexico on a sailboat without a mast. I'm Shauna. My name's Travis. And we were the family that was dismasted in the Pacific Ocean, 950 miles offshore. Can we just get a brief, very brief history of like your, your background before we go into the whole event? Uh, this is my fourth boat. I've been sailing for about 15 years plus a little bit. Really had the dream of getting my family on board one day and just got very lucky in the way it all came about. October of 2020, we left Santa Cruz and started our cruising, living aboard and all that. But basically it was just refitting the boat and then it was go time. And did you feel confident in the boat? 100%. Yeah. We broke a few things and were able to fix them and the rig was done previously by the owner who was an engineer and that was something that we never thought would be a problem. So we, when we left, we utilized the weather router and um, they kept pushing us further west because weather was coming. They said that Wednesday it's going to start getting, the wind is going to start picking up and then Thursday is going to get, the seas are growing and Friday is going to be the worst day. So we kind of knew it was coming and it was, it was a weird feeling because Wednesday was such a great day, like sailing. It was, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 knots and just it was nice it was a great day but then it was like there's this like looming feeling like you know something is coming but you can't really do anything about it it continued to get a little bit stronger and the seas were getting bigger we both needed to be at the ready in order to to keep going so we decided to heave to and so we did that early Thursday morning after we put the third reef in and we kind of like played with it a little bit and um, finally we're like lying hove to for almost that whole day and then around midnight the traveler or we just heard a big boom we didn't know what happened so we both run out there the kids were sleeping cue the kids <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> Yeah, so we, we ran out there to see what was going on and we saw that the traveler had, had broke and the boom was way out, out to the side and it was blowing probably 30, it was 30 knots and seas were like, I don't know, 12 to 15 feet. Yeah. That was the catalyst that started everything that happened after that. I was having a dream that a meteor crashed through the top. <laughs> when I heard that boom, it was like a, you know, and I woke up, like, whoa, and she's like, what was that? And I just remember randomly, like, the salt shaker, like, the lid popped off, and I was like, that's weird, like, what happened? Yeah. yeah. Automatic, like, heart racing, you know, fight or flight response. So we went out and flicked on the spreader, and you just saw the boom just pressed against the stays, and it was just flying downwind. There's nothing we could really do except get the boom back on board and we got that secure and then we were running bare poles fairly well and I ended up deploying just maybe a pillowcase worth of the staysail and we sailed like that for six hours. It was pitch black, no moon and yeah so we just thought well we're already going towards our waypoint so I guess we'll just get going then. You didn't see no. any damage on the rigging? Couldn't see anything. But also, the, when we turned on the spreader lights, the boom was all the way over, you know, and the sail was up, and you couldn't see any of it. Then, fast forward, Travis takes the first watch, and I try to get some sleep. And around 6, I come out there, because it's almost daylight, where we're gonna, we're gonna trade. He was so high, like, so happy. 
like he was like this is the best ever he's like check it out like the boat is just sailing so beautifully and look at the bioluminescence and i just listened to this awesome album and let me get it ready for you so you can you know you, he was gonna get me all set up so i could do my watch and then i just fed the baby so i thought okay he's gonna sleep and then i'm gonna go out and switch to trav but i was sitting right there with him and we were discussing it and then Tiago started crying again, so he's like, okay, don't worry, just go take care of him and we can, it's almost daylight, so we'll just, you know, at daylight we'll, we'll swap. And so I came back down and, um, and then that's when we heard, like, the, another big boom, <laughs> like a really big boom. I was like, oh my god, what was that? And I run up there. I was sitting in the can, I turn around and I look like that, and then... This, the solar panel shattered. And then I turned a little farther and my radar was like, I could touch the radar that was 40 feet up, you know, five seconds before that. And I remember she said, well, what is it? And I was like, fuck, dude, the, the dream, it's over. Yeah. Um. And and yeah, that was pretty much... Then it was like, what do we do? Like, we're so far out here. We have our kids on board. You know, are we taking on water? There were so many, like, things going through the mind at the time. Like, and then during all of this, you still have high winds, still have these huge seas. And, you know, and now you have this metal thing clinging against the, the hull. The sound was like, oh. And so then it was like, well, what do we do? Do we, or do we push the SOS? Like, what, what do we do? And so finally I was just like, I'm doing it because I feel like might as well call for help now and then we'll like assess the situation and see what we can do. And then his sister, we had a, a float plan that we had given to his sister, Corey. And I messaged her with the Garmin and said, Corey, we need help. Um, follow the float plan. Worst nightmare you'll ever face. And I, first we're like, okay, are we taking on water? No. Like, my thought was, just cut it away. Just get it away. <laughs> He's like, well, I can't just cut it away. Like, there's, it's attached by so many things. My first instinct was to grab the grinder and just cut the stays a foot above the stays. But one problem was that we have furled head sails and that wire isn't visible. So what I ended up doing was grabbing wire cutters and a ball pin hammer and I was just clipping the cotter pin and knocking out the clevis pin and then I would free a stay. So I had her untying the stopper knots on all of the sheets, you know, and like releasing, making sure everything was free because like, fuck, so many, like she said, so many things are attached, you know, you have everything. The staysail was in the water, but it was like full of water. So I knew I wasn't getting that on board. And then the, the big head sail was kind of like ripped through the lifelines and was overboard as well in the water. And so I was trying to do it as thought out as possible under the stress of her freaking out, the kids puking, the baby screaming, and like I thought if I just got the grinder out and sparks are just going crazy, just madhouse, that like it might just push her over the edge. Yeah, then the next messages from Corey were like, they have a boat, but you have to get off and abandon your boat. Leave it in the ocean. And so that is what we were, that's what I thought. How did you feel when you got that uh, response that you were all gonna have to leave the boat? Horrible, horrible because then it was like, well, do we really want the help? And so there were so many like big decisions to be made while so much is going on at the same time. We're gonna lose everything. We're gonna lose it all. But I would rather that than lose my kids. Something bad happened. I just wanna tap out. I wanna to give up the ship. And I told Chad, I said, no matter what, we can rebuild. We know how to do that. We came from nothing and we created this. So it's like the hard decision because you can't take anything. You just leave everything, everything that we work for, everything that we have. And that's when I went, no, the boat's fine. And she says, it's not fine. I said, but it is fine. <laughs> it's not taking on water. 
provision for French Polynesia for six months. Like, but I got the kids being seasick and all that. He was not doing well. He's a breastfed baby. Like, I'm already so exhausted. How am I going to be able to do it? How can I be on full watch, full ready to, to get us to the next point and also take care of him and the other kids? Like, I just felt like I couldn't do it. And I was feeling horrible. And I remember telling Travis, like, I'm so sorry. I can't do it. <laughs> and it wasn't until much later, I feel like Travis got the mask freed in about two hours. And, um, and then at some point, Mike from PD Sailing was like, is your intention for you and the kids to get off and Travis to stay on. If the Coast Guard gets involved or the Navy, you know, otherwise, if, if they're the ones that come and take you, um, they do, they take you. They basically will tell the captain, your choice, you pull the plug or we do. In this case, when I was talking to Travis and they're, they're with the freighter, I said, right, so what are your intentions? Are you going to sink the vessel or are you gonna self-rescue? And we're like, that's an option. So then it was like, okay, can you do it? Or like, is that what we're gonna do? And I think that's where I really decided I was gonna stay when I got this bag and I started filling this bag up with things I wanted to take. And there was just too much to carry. And I remember just going like, fuck, I'm staying, dude, no way. I had my dad's ashes, you know, he passed away, so I had all his ashes and I poured them all out. And I was just, yeah, we've been all my friends that have ashes. passed the ashes. And like, I was just, it was too gnarly. I was like, dude, I'm not getting off this boat. I have not seen this that big in, in this boat, like just looking like big walls coming at me. And like, you know, I remember Travis went down and I'm like, please come back out here, please, please, Trav. Because he's like looking around to see what he's gonna try to take off the boat. and. Um, I mean, we're just a wreck. I wasn't going to try to convince him to get off because I knew that if I made him get off the boat that he would regret it for the rest of his life. And so I would, that wasn't even, my thing was just like, I, I felt bad because I wish that I could have been able to help and stay on. They pull up and they block, they go and they try to block as much of the swell and the wind as possible. And then I had to pull up on the side and there's this giant painting on the side that says, do not get sucked into these props. Like just, I forgot what it said. Like, And they kept, they kept telling us to on the radio. And it was this current, it was trying to stay in place. So it was creating this current and and we were in the, the leeward side of it. So it wasn't as windy, but the swells were still gnarly and the boats going up and oh. down and I'm trying to, I knew I was staying, so I was like trying to save the boat. I was putting these fenders out, and they kept popping up like whack a mole, and I'm pushing well, them down. Get your arms out of there! She like, screw me! I'm like, shut up! <laughs> Stop dying! Like, well, his Are arm, you like, your get arm's your gonna get like, crushed. <laughs> so, yeah, and then they were lowering down this huge gateway, you know, with these two guys on board, and he's talking to me over them, mic and my radios, like, fuzz, fuzzy and crazy. They said her first with the baby, so. We got her as finally they got us kind of centered where they wanted us. They lowered this thing down almost to the deck of the sailboat and got her up and she was safe and she like collapsed and just bawling her eyes out screaming. <laughs> so that was sad. <laughs> yeah. And saying goodbye. Like, I can't tell you how hard that was. Like, what am I just going to leave him in this, in the ocean? <laughs> like, yeah. And I had to get the boys. Up. That was really sad. And then he reached for my hand and I said, no <laughs> way, and I pushed away. And, uh, and that was it. Faded off. I swear her cargo ship just fuck, disappeared so fast. It was like, I think they were going 20 knots. 20 knots into the distance, gone. And I was like, oh, fuck. I just texted her. I go, I think this is a death wish. I don't know what uh, I was thinking. when I got internet I don't on the have boat. fucking autopilot or enough fuel or anything, you know, but I also, that was my choice. So at this point, Travis was 950 miles away from the coast of Mexico. His family had just sailed away on a cargo ship and he was all alone. The autopilot wasn't working. He knew he didn't have enough fuel. 
Can you imagine what was going through his head right then? From there on, you know, we had it too. Okay, he's committed. Now, we got to really, really work on how our network works here because he just put himself there. And rightfully so. I mean, no problem. He made it and, and the boat could do it. If it was a situation when I was talking to him that I felt no, I would have said, dude, don't even waste your time. But, yeah, and he's got a sturdy boat. It's a West Sail 43. It's a tank. That thing can go through anything. And now it's just a matter of making it go uphill. Well, day one, no mast, demasted. I wasn't unhappy with the decision, but I was also like, didn't feel like I really had the tools to make it at that point. And the boat was very, very, very hard to manage, and I was all by myself, and like they, like downstairs was just destroyed. Oh, was I mean, I've never disaster. seen. It was, it was bad. I mean, there's puke everywhere, and there's everything, plural and glass, and just. The toilet? The toilet the, seat, the head was, seat was off. I don't know how that like, happened. What is going on here, you know? Like, everyone's <laughs> gone, and like, I knew it was time to get to work. Well, working on getting the house cleaned back up. It's gonna be my bed for the next week or so. Two weeks, maybe. You can see, very rocky. The waves are coming, it's very stormy outside. See if we can see some storm. Whoa. I had to come down and put my Fowleys on for the first time in you know two years. And I was soaking wet and I was tired and we don't have a Dodger, so like the water's going over my glasses and I couldn't see and the Garmin is like not a very good experience typing on the Garmin. Total pain in the butt, it was in reach. <laughs> You're, you've got 130 characters, you know? And you gotta do it with him. And I know for him initially, he's doing it all on a little board that's like the size of an old cell phone, trying to make that go. And um, yeah, that, that wasn't easy for him for a while. And I didn't have the app to pair the phone. And so I was trying to type and I'm getting all these messages from people about like, you know, did you make the right decision? Like, oh, what are you doing on board? Like, it's just a boat, it's just this, it's just that. And I'm like, fuck, what are you people like saying to me right now? Like. It's not just a boat, it's our, it's our house, you know? There's a way to do it, I'm gonna do it. We may have lost our mask, but I'm not gonna let the dream die yet. I think I can save our ship. I'm gonna try my hardest. The only problem is I don't have a pilot. Your world shrinks to the size of your boat in that kind of moment. Definitely. Did you feel like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. mine actually shrank to the cockpit because I really didn't want to go forward. I was freaking scared to go forward. I don't know why, but it's just oh, super sketchy. <laughs> yeah. and there was wires sticking out of the where the mass was, and there was just like, all the railing was over the side. And it took all the way all the running lights and everything, so I had to like make some emergency like running lights and all this stuff out to sea, and I just felt like. The vicious ocean was trying to take all my tools and just like everything was trying to throw me off and like I'm like God like when are you gonna give me a break dude like come on you know he's got the trauma of what's happened already he's got the concerns about his family and then he's got himself in a situation with a vessel that is he, you know it's hindered it's supposed to be a sailboat now it's a powerboat <laughs> and having to push it from where they were you know, that far south of Clarion Island and having to punch, punch that thing upwind. A sailboat without a rig does not go well. It's not an easy, not an easy pull. The next morning I woke up, it was calmer. I was like, all right, here we go. You know, the swells are dying down a bit. It's time. And I went to start the engine and the fuel pump was fried. And I looked, it's an electrical lift pump. And I remembered the smoke coming out of it. And I was like, oh man, what gnarly. Like, dude, are you kidding me? So I did have a, a spare, which I put on within like five minutes. I'd done it before, so I knew exactly what I was gonna do when it came time. Good job, Dad. So I put on the spare, and then I tried to jump it so I wouldn't have to go out into the cockpit and turn on the ignition. So I tried to jump it to the alternator, but I sizzled it within, I don't know, five, five seconds. 
dung dung dunks. I just I remember looking at it like and now I have two dead pumps and I just I was pretty I was pretty defeated at that point. When he blew the pump, I said, Right, no big deal. You just have to put the boat in drag and and help him address that so the boat wouldn't go too far from where it was and everybody could find the target and then coordinate back and forth with each of the boats to get them online where he was and then get them in communication and then get the you know get the fuel pass and the parts pass. Well tonight people are coming to save the day. I'm trying to save the ship. My last chance get an electronic fuel pump delivered in the middle of the fucking ocean. I'm very gracious people I do not know who they are. It's super cool. There's three boats coming tonight. And I had to sit there and I had to drift for three days waiting for these three boats coming. The first two just had fuel and they were sending me hot meals, which was freaking amazing. The whole time the seas were so big that when people would give me the fuel, I would have to send a, a line out, 125 foot, half inch, three strand nylon line with like 25 feet of floating line with a fender on the end and some rope and then they would tie on fuel and then I would have to pull it in over the you know, gnarly sea and get it in the boat and then I would have to siphon it into the tank and it was just so brutal. SVRN pulled up and they were the first boat I saw on the horizon. I remember just like, actually I pulled out the flares, it's like, you know, shooting my flares off. Finally got to shoot the flares <laughs> we off. we have no radio contact until they get yeah. very close. I don't know what the distance was, but. But they they had me on AIS, so like they were coming at me and I remember shooting the flares off and then I had the line already all sorted and everything was going, you know, the best way. So they kind of did a couple of rounds before they could get it with the hook and then. They say, oh, oh yeah, we're gonna give, we got feel for you, but we also got a couple goodies, you know? And I'm like, all right, sweet, like whatever, you know? And like all of a sudden these big plastic blown up seal meal bags were like these hot noodles and like all this <laughs> sauces that were so psyched on that. Like, I just couldn't believe these people were doing this. So I'm like, who are they? Like, and I didn't even think about food for him, you know? Like when in the, in the WhatsApp group, I'm like, yeah, great, excellent. Yeah, that's a great idea. We've um, really honed in the communications part of this uh, Pacific Voyagers group, and it's it's better than it's ever been. And I think that was very instrumental also in how everybody was able to communicate. And that was a yep. <laughs> herding cats type of thing. And then the next boat pulled up. Same thing. They unloaded the fuel. Must be midnight breeze. Midnight breeze, and they had this uh, just more food and more fuel and then the last boat was mowing is that lagoon and she her name is peggy his wife and dirk she, and peggy dirk and peggy and she made these like buckets of goulash and so he gives me this lift pump and it was this european crazy looking thing this metal box i've never seen before and i had one chance to to really get that going and i knew that was it I'll give it a go, you know? And the guy says like, oh, you know, I'm gonna sit here and he's doing circles <laughs> around my boat. And he's got all those kids on board and they have a 63 foot lagoon. And he says, well, mate, I'm not leaving you out here. And if you can't get it started, you're coming with us. We're ready to take you on board, you know? And I like looked up at the, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, okay, I'll give me a sec. And so I went down there and I remember just bleeding the engine, just wah, 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 wah. And then it finally just started. And I was just, wow, oh, you kidding me. Oh my god, it's on, dude. And I got all their fuel cans on board, and I just remember cracking into that goulash. And then the next boat that was coming to him was Eliza, and she said, we have a printer on board. Would you like to, like, if the boys want to draw a picture? I was like, another great idea. And then the waterworks started again. <laughs> Seeing yeah. your boys. Yeah. I just couldn't believe it. So I just kind of collapsed on the floor there. And yeah, those pictures came, and that was just like, all right, just fucking now it's go time. And then when I started making, when I cracked that 370 mark and started making momentum, like I felt like I went over like a top of the hill, you know, and like it was like now it was, dude, the miles are starting to click away. And then here we are at 93.99. Make sure this autopilot keeps us on course here. Make it or break it, baby. Really got enough fuel, doggy. But I was also running low on fuel, and I 
was talking to PV Sailing Mike, and I was probably 30 miles away. I go, bro, I've never seen my tank this low. Like, I don't, I don't think I have fuel. It doesn't matter whether he's going five knots or two knots, he's still gonna burn a gallon an hour. So for that first uphill, he was just burning a lot of fuel. And ultimately he got to Clarion and he had only had about two gallons of gas. Yeah. So Clarion is an island 550 miles off the coast of Mexico. So he had finally made it all the way upwind to Clarion, but he still had a long way to go to get home to here, Puerto Vallarta. But this is where the story gets really heartwarming. The boats that met him at Clarion and Socorro, they were set up here ahead of time. And we did a, a big thing with our community to get the fuel jugs together. One boat was over in Vallarta, Marina Vallarta, and he got in an Uber with four uh, jugs filled and Ubered all the way over and dropped them off. I mean, everybody who stepped, stepped up, up. everyone stepped, stepped up. All these beautiful donated cans of fuel that came in to be extra, I picked up in Clarion. Sea Legacy came through and dropped some fuel and the thing what Travis was most excited about was the avocados yeah. <laughs> that they gave him. Not meeting Paul Nicklin, you know, as he's like doing the story <laughs> on me, but I was like, oh, well, where's the avo? Oh. <laughs> you guys got an avo in here, you know? And, and so that was pretty rad. And uh, another boat, they had Starlink, and I just, I remember going like, what, you have internet out here? Are you kidding me? And like, she's like, oh, you want to call your wife? And so. That was Thursday's child. Yeah, so I call her, and I'm like, hey, babe, what's up? And she's like, oh, uh, I think you have the wrong number. And I'm like, who do I up? I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And at that point, I hadn't heard his voice. I hadn't, you know, I had seen Paul's story on Instagram and, um, was able to see Travis's face and like talking and smiling. Seeing that video was like game changing for me. And a bonus I got was in Clarion, they sent me out a crew member and he walked down and I put him in bed that night after the boats came and he offloaded and he fell out of the V-berth and then he rolled, I lowered the table and this is where he laid for the next three days. So I didn't really ever have any help, but I did have to, care for a crew member that was injured. He has a fractured pelvis. <laughs> so for the next week, I was cooking and cleaning and nursing a patient. Can you believe Travis's luck? He'd come all of this way alone and the good deed that Mike was trying to do ended up being a burden on him, as if he didn't already have enough on his plate. It kind of gave me a new perspective on saving the boat. I was more concerned about saving him because he was just he was not doing well. And I didn't really have any pain meds. All I had was ibuprofen and, and ice. Uh, as soon as I heard about what had happened, uh, my friend Christian called me, told me the story, and I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll be there. Yeah, I'm gonna go 350 miles offshore without even asking to go bring somebody fuel that needs it. And that's what it means to be a mariner. And day of departure, we showed up, we loaded 150 gallons. I think we had like 25 jerry cans along uh, the starboard rail. And we uh, departed for Socorro. And ironically, you know, we, we ripped a mainsail along the way and wham, we nailed a rock. And, you know, violent, violent too. Immediately after we hit the rock, got to the anchorage, our, we had to shift gears away from the boat so we offloaded the fuel to the Mexican Navy, who were awesome, by the way, like really kudos to the Mexican Navy. All of the organized side of, of government on this with the, the Coast Guard or the Mexican Navy and rescue, all of them were great. And imagine loading up that much fuel on a vessel to deliver offshore what that must look like. You got a boat like uh, Aquila taking taking 180 gallons of fuel out, hmm, which drug boat are you going to? It would be the point of view they'll have right yeah. away, you know? Need to break it down, needed to, to make sure we needed to organize that they were gonna receive all that fuel in Socorro at the Navy and also help get that to Nini Wahuni when they came, you know, they, they came in. 20 miles out, sunrise in Mexico. Come on, Nini Wahuni, let's get it. You know, the communication with them when we finally got them in the bay was pretty amazing because now all of a sudden the phones come on and you all of a sudden feel the release, you know, you feel the weight off that, okay, this is good, you know, we have it. You didn't get that until they broke 20 miles away. 
So as we're coming up and seeing the land, like a, a dinghy ran out, you know, and he was just kind of like, you know, do you guys need anything right now? Like, I'm like, no, we're good, you know, and like, I just couldn't believe that we had made it that far, and I was, I was kind of like losing it a little bit, just, just emotional. He was coming into the marina as I was leaving the marina, and I just ran up onto the finger of the dock and was like, yeah, baby, and, and it just, my heart like burst out of my chest. And there they are, dock side, Travis, woo! It was like such a relief and so happy just that he made it. Yeah! Yeah! Come hug your wife! <laughs> and now that we were all together again, the boys are super stoked too. Yeah, and they jumped on and they tried to make him get off. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> And then I ran over there, booked it over to where he was going to the slip, and his family was there, Shauna was there, his baby was there, his kids were there, and it was, it was, I started crying. Yeah. I lost it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't think there was a dry eye on the dock. No. So we had been waiting to meet Nini Wahuni on the dock, but we'd actually gone to the wrong dock. So by the time we got there, Travis had already reunited with his family, and it was one of the most beautiful things I've seen in a very long time. And this guy thought I was gonna miss the whole baby phase. Luckily, yeah, I was like, I is he gonna remember dad? And I'm like, you better remember me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you. Uh, Dirk! Hey, man. Yeah, bro. Good to see you. Hi, Peggy. The goulash is amazing. I dream about it when I'm drinking diesel. I'm imagining it's goulash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you guys. I'm stoked you made it. Thank you for your help. You saved my life. You saved my life, bro. So what's the plan from here? Currently, we're under under work doing the stainless steel, getting the stanchions back and the lifelines back up and getting all that sorted. There's one bent chain plate, and honestly, other than a survey, I think we're ready to rig from the chain plates up. It's just gonna be how how we get the mast and boom, and I don't know. We're just, just stepping into it, and for some reason, I believe that it's gonna happen. It's just never give up it's been my biggest lesson i just had to keep saying that over and over just do not give up like do not give up you're gonna figure it out and like where there's a will there's a way and just never give up the dream and that was just all i had to live by the whole time and here we are you can't do something like this without without the neighborhood you know it it's uh, it's a very unique society that we live in we travel the most distance of anyone in the world, and we are a small community. We all know that if we go offshore, that could happen to us too. Everybody is very willing to step up because, yeah, it could be me. And everybody takes it very seriously. I think people that work on the ocean, it's kind of more of a, a soldier mentality. And when somebody's in need, it doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing. Like, you drop everything and you go there immediately. For this year, the Pacific Crossing dream is over. I'm dismasted, I'm not discouraged. Like it's, this is just like a, we're gonna have to go back and fix it and then we're gonna keep going. Like this is just what it is right now. That's nothing I can do other than that. No, the dream is alive and well. We just need to get this thing built back a little bit stronger and we are definitely coming. Super yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's on. It's super on. <laughs> yeah. What an absolutely inspirational story, a story of someone who never gave up, who was determined to save his family home, and it was an absolutely devastating blow to their entire Pacific Crossing plans. I personally am gonna donate all of the ad revenue of this episode to their GoFundMe. If any of you guys wanna do your good deed for the week, find a place in your heart to donate to this family, get them sailing again. They need a whole new rig, all new rigging. It's been a massive, massive setback for them, but. Trust me, they're an amazing family. We've gotten to know them quite a bit and do what you can to help them out. Thanks for watching, guys. Our deepest gratitude to everyone that helped us out from the bottom of our hearts. We're so thankful Thank you. for all the generosity. We wouldn't have been able to do this rescue and recovery without each and every one of you. Thank you for inspiring us to just keep the ripple effect going and just paying it forward. Thank you. Thank you.